Tom was such a handbrake turn in another direction, and to play this moron, really, quite a sympathetic man, but somebody described him as a human grease stain, which I thought was quite good. But to play this kind of person is such a departure, it was just bliss, it was just a real relief. This is HBO Succession Podcast. This is Roger Bennett, a.k.a. that corn-fed basic from Hockey Town. My guest today is a smarmy brown-nosed king of beta maleness, a zenia-clad parasitic social climbing mentor tormentor, water bottle flinging, org chart obsessive, cuckold crown prince of doom love. One of television's great nervous laughers, a man whose DNA is 83% FOMO. Oh, yes, Tom Wamsgams, the submissive Minnesota nice ultimate wife guy to Shiv Roy, who married his way straight into the death pit at Waystar Royco, like a moth attracted to the flame of obscene wealth. Look, here's the thing about being rich, okay? It's fucking great, okay? It's like being a superhero, only better. You get to do what you want. The authorities can't really touch you. You get to wear a costume, but it's designed by Armani and it doesn't make you look like a prick. But Wamsgans is so much more than a one-dimensional comic stooge, mostly because my guest plays him so deftly, a state of mind he's artfully described as being half suave, half dickhead. Oh, the darker <laughs> Wamsgans gets, the more endearing he becomes. And as season two stealth tragic arc unravels, that's plenty dark. Our hero oh, also happens to be played by one of the most beloved British actors alive today. A bloke who defined himself as a period drama staple. A lot of waistcoats, tweed and facial hair have been attached to my guest. On the way to becoming succession scene stealer to me an all-time television character, fresh off his Emmy nomination for Best Drama Supporting Actor. It's a delight to welcome, oh, Matthew McFadden. <laughs> Rog, thank you so much. That was the most fabulous introduction I've ever, or could ever hope to hear about myself. And I'd like it in writing. I can die happy now. Few deserve it more, Matthew. <laughs> I've got to say, off the top, congratulations. On your Emmy nomination, Matthew. I imagine Tom Wamsgams would be quite impressed by the nature of your achievement. He would be desperately overexcited and driving Siobhan mad. He wouldn't sleep for days and days and days and days. I didn't actually realise it was 18 nominated. Mark and Andre, you a couple of our directors and our production designer and Nick Rattel, who wrote Extraordinary Music, and Cherry Jones and Harriet Walter, as well as guest actors who've had nominated. So it's really fabulous. It's really gratifying. I think even Jonah got one for Best Human Stool. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jonah. Oh, God bless Jonah. Yeah, that's one for the tribunal, isn't it? Can't wait for season three, Jonah's Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, you have had some career spooks. MI5 in America, Tom Quinn, Man of Action, The Perfect Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice, Ripper Street's Detective Inspector Edmund Reed, Serious Men doing serious things. Yeah. You've said playing Tom was unlike anything you've ever done. It was, quote, like sweeping out the cupboard. And I don't want to project. What does that mean? It means flexing another muscle. I think most actors, you have a sort of vanity that you, well, you lose your vanity the longer you're an actor, but you do have a sort of <laughs> professional vanity that you think, I can sort of do anything. When you're a young actor, you think, let me play any part. Pick me, and I'll put on the costume and the funny voice and the walk, and then inevitably you have a bit of success in one type of role. You get offered those types of roles. So it's trying to be canny and not do too much of the same thing. And I have been lucky. I haven't done too much, but Tom was such a... A handbrake turn in another direction and to play this moron really quite a sympathetic man but somebody described him as a human grease stain which i thought was quite good but to play this kind of person is such a departure it was just bliss it was just a real relief because i could reinvent it and it's american which is a big jump for a brick i read that when you first glimpsed the script for the pilot you were struck by the ridiculousness of the whole thing that it was Laugh out loud funny. Yeah. And as American as the story is, you know, Manhattan billionaires. Would it be true to say it's funny, caustic in a very British way that there's really a British sensibility at the heart of succession? I think there is, partly because it comes from the amazing, lovely, brilliant brain of Jesse Armstrong. And there are lots of Brits in the writer's room. Maybe it allows them to be a bit more gimlet-eyed about it, a bit clearer-eyed about 
the society. And... That's my theory, anyway. But there's something very British about the actual sense of humour. Yeah, it's hard-edged. It's really acidic and sort of uncomfortable. It's like the English office compared to the American office. It's ass clenching in a way that... <laughs> That the American office isn't. You think, oh, God. Yeah, I don't want my Auntie Kathleen watching this. That's what the Emmy nominators are looking for. Good old-fashioned arse clenching and talk... Arse clenching. <laughs> yeah. Talking of Englishness. Yeah, accent and voice. It's hard to communicate to American succession fans how revered your vocal tones are in the UK. <laughs> You've done so many high-end commercials. It's impossible to turn on the television without... Hearing you, Matthew, talking about cars or vodka. M&S was very good to me for a while. Marks and Spencers. Oh, really, when you see those commercials, that's a national institution marketing a national institution. You were for a long time. The voice of Harrods in the in-store PA system. This is it. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take the opportunity to remind you tonight the store <laughs> closes at 8 o'clock. It's very hard to say Harrods Rewards Card. If you don't have a Harrods <laughs> Rewards Card, you can pick one up in store. Harrods Rewards Card. It's very good for general diction. Keeps the wolf from the door. It was a lifesaver. I had a, I had a funny year, which is a bit barren, and Harrods saved me. And they very kindly gave me a Harrods teddy bear every Christmas for the kids. Magic. That accent, the one that says, tonight the store closes at eight o'clock. That accent was described <laughs> by The Guardian as distinctive and as old-fashioned as cigar smoke. So how was it for you teaching that accent, that national treasure, to act in American. I was really nervous about doing an American accent, to be honest. I found it quite hard. Sarah and I are the only, well, Brian's a Brit as well, but Logan was born in Scotland, so it's slightly different. She's Australian and I'm a Brit and everyone else is native US, so it's quite scary. Especially in the pilot, Adam and Jesse were very keen that we improvised a lot. It's one thing sort of learning your lines in another accent, but then improvising is a whole other world of hell and fear. Especially when you're a half-wit like me, especially when you're supposed to improvise about the financial markets. I go very high. I sort of go, <laughs> I think it's fear. I'm scared of my wife in it. So it's very, honey, honey, honey. Oh, no, no. Funnily enough, I was sharing an interview on a radio show here with Denzel Washington. He's one of my favorite actors. He was very interesting. He said he played a Cockney soldier years and years ago. And he said the same thing. He went very high. He <laughs> was talking. We bonded over a sort of accent work. That Denzel Washington, yeah. that Tom Wamsgam's mashup, Weird. is something that I want the Reddit succession hive to get all over. But let's talk about the character of Tom or the characters because that bloke is a totally different person where pretty much everybody he's with. There's at least two major Toms. There's the Tom of Greg yeah. and the Tom of Shiv. Power mad sadist and pliant people pleaser a tragic clown either way you were once asked to describe the character and you answered he's a prick <laughs> what is the secret to playing a prick so endearingly he genuinely thinks that at times he's doing his best and he's doing quite a good job of things under a lot of pressure very high powered family complicated relationships a big job you know he's running a sort of billion dollar arm of waystar and I think sometimes he thinks he's doing really well. I think he thinks he's quite heroic and intelligent and dynamic. And sometimes he knows he's fucked up. All of us, to varying degrees, are different with whoever we're with. And with Tom, it's maxed out. He's so different with the two major people in his life, Greg, played by Nick Braun, and Shiv, played by Sarah Snook. And they never meet. They're never all together. I think once very briefly, but they're never together. So Shiv will never see the Tom with Greg. It's almost like you never see Clark Kent and Superman in the same room. You never see the Tom no. of Greg and the Tom of Shiv together. But Tom is an outsider to power. And that's probably the one thing he fetishizes more than anything. And he'll do anything to cling on to it, as you see with his handling of the death pit to order the destruction of records, detailing evidence of cruise crimes so dark, even by Waystar standards. Something he's encouraged to do by the culture and the family members that surround him. There's a scene with Kendall and Tom that I love. You know, my dad always said, he'd say he loved all his employees, but he particularly loved the guys who ate the shit for him and he never even knew it. Got it. Got it. Excuse me while I get myself a knife and a fork and some holidays. Would it be true to say that most of what Tom does professionally, where we actually never see him do anything of any merit, despite his mm. massive job titles, most definitely in his personal life, his dominant governing emotion is fear. I'd agree with that. Fear of doing the wrong thing. Fear of 
not making the right impression, fear of being undermined, fear of someone else taking his spot. It must be very hard <laughs> being him. It's very nice to play him because it's very therapeutic. I mean, we talk about ass clenching moments. There are some scenes I'm sweating with embarrassment acting them you know there's a quote of yours you said i honestly feel like with succession i don't learn the lines they just mm. go into my head because i just want to say them and i can see why because Wamsgams, or as logan calls him a crude variation on the count of monte cristo has some of the most indelible television lines of the last decade first take us inside that underground bachelor party scene at rhomboid <laughs> tom Determined to make good on the whole pass he doesn't actually want, but has been given by his fiance Shiv. He hooks up with Tabitha and then confesses all to Greg. <gasps> Matthew, the closed loop <laughs> system. When you read that for the first time, are you like, yes, this is Pete Wamsgams? Or are you like, Jesse Bloody Armstrong, you are a bad, bad man? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. But mostly it's sort of delicious anticipation. And then slight worry because I think I'm never going to get through this with Nick who plays Greg, if we see a glimmer of a twinkle of any kind of corpsing or breaking up, we're gone. So we really have to behave. Nick and I find it very hard to get through scenes. How many takes for that scene at the bar? I don't think very many, actually. SJ Clarkson directed it brilliantly. She was wonderful. Like a lot of really good scenes in succession, we shoot pretty quickly. And because they're so well written, we sort of rehearse and then shoot and then we've got it. And then because there's only so many times you can keep doing it i think so we shot that quite quickly and there was one lovely bit which was cut sj <laughs> organized this and we didn't know sj got one of the essays to throw up on the bar just by tom's head <laughs> enough for us to just to react to that as a sort of coda to this <laughs> but they didn't use it in the end <laughs> there's an awful lot of little add-ons to the scenes which don't make it but they're delicious to do i read that the bore on the floor scene which was devastating to me as a viewer in my personal psyche but there was a scene that they didn't use of you looking up from the bottom of a swimming pool an empty swimming pool i'm looking up and they're all sort of drinking scotch and looking down at me laughing and i have to take off my sweater and then we don't know what happened. <laughs> God, a hazing so dark that even <laughs> even the final edit of Succession could not bear it. But that is really the depths of the suffering this man has gone through. And I want to talk about Tom and his relationship with a couple of the key players. First, Logan Roy. I mean, a lot of listeners will feel that they have the in-laws from hell. Tom, gold medals in that really category. Does. Uh, he yeah. does seem genuinely terrified of Logan. Do you feel that fear when you, Matthew, enter a scene with Brian Cox? I don't need much of a runway to build into it because all the other actors, including Brian, are just titanically good. And so it's not a great leap of the imagination to look at them and think, I'm scared of this person, or I want to please this person, or I want to kick this person. You know, it's all there for you. And so certainly with Brian, it's easy to slip into a panic when Tom's with Logan, because he's so fierce and gruff and implacable you know it just sort of looks at you so it's terrifying which brings us to the chicken scene on a giant luxury 280 foot super yacht you're off croatia but he's unraveling humiliated himself in congressional hearings grip on his job is tenuous relationship with his wife imploding he's even lost bloody greg in the water bottle flinging frenzy of the wrong safe room so he's desperately yeah trying to exert some kind of control, marches up to the most fearsome guy in the room, Logan Roy, munching on the drumstick, grabs some. And steals his lunch. Yes, and then walks off. Yeah, my heart was banging when we did that. Partly because I had to technically eat on this yacht, and so you think, I don't want to choke, and I want to get it right. And The first take, it was chicken breast, right? I got a big bit of chicken breast, which was a mistake, and I couldn't speak, and Brian laughed, and Brian never laughs, very rarely. And so when he <laughs> laughed... I was weeping. I was, I was sweating and weeping with with his with sort of nervous hilarity. And then I got a you know drumstick. Things were better then. It's a beginner's move to go chicken breast. It was. It was a schoolboy error. Was it a tiny act of defiance and Tom trying to prove himself to his father, or was he trying to prove himself to himself? I think a bit of both. But I think he sort of thinks I've got nothing left to lose, and I also think he really believes he's going to be the one who's sacrificed on the altar of the dreadful cruise horror that's about to be uncovered and he feels so unmanned by Siobhan and 
that marriage and the suggestion of having a threesome, this sort of open relationship that he's desperately trying to be cool with and isn't. I don't think he's planned. I think he just, you know, just comes up and and does it. I believe you had some extra lines of remorse as you actually walked off that were cut out. Is he looking? What's he doing? What's the old boy doing? There's that. And then Sarah says, my God, I've never seen the chicken power play before. And I think she sort of thinks, hmm, sexy. Good for him. It's quite an attractive thing to do. Less attractive to Logan Roy, his subsequent line. He ate my fucking chicken. Uh-huh. So what next? Stick his cock into my potato salad? But I think maybe grudgingly, you know, somewhere in Logan, he's thinking, hmm respect and probably knowing tom he's probably thinking hmm cock in the potato salad not a bad next step let's turn though from logan tom's boss to greg you can't make a tomlet without breaking some gregs i mean it's a toxic bromance lenny smalls and george milton meets dumb and dumber it's off kilter for the onset tom seems threatened by greg comes at him hard would you kiss me what would you kiss you if i asked you to I Have I told you to? Huh? Oh. I don't... <laughs> Come on. What drives this in his mind? Is he territorial? Because in his mind, there's only room for one outsider to be treated like the family punch bag. I think that's it. And I think that was the pilot. When I read that, then you don't know that it's going to go on. I didn't know who Tom was. But that scene sort of crystallised something. I think often as an actor, you can worry about why people are doing things too much. And actually... In life, we don't know why we do things. We don't know why we say certain things or behave in the way that we do. It's only later we go, oh my God, I am, you know, I'm insane. Or I did this because of this. It's sort of great for human beings, but great for an actor because you can go, well, he just turns on this man who ostensibly is quite sweet. But I think Tom worries that he's also an outsider. You're right. But he's family. He's actually blood, which Tom isn't. And he's taller than Tom, which somewhere must worry it's not and i'm six foot three and greg's six foot seven so that's a worry you know he's just eaten so much shit throughout that episode with that silly patek philippe that he's trying to give logan that he just turns on greg just to sort of salvage the day i suppose tom is the kind of beta who does when someone else walks into the room that their first thought is can i take them can I take yeah. him? And the answer is almost always no, but he still asks the question <laughs> in every regard. But pretty quickly, yeah. Tom begins to view Greg as protege. There is an element of my fair lady about their relationship. When Greg draws his first paycheck, Tom asks how he's going to celebrate. I was thinking about maybe going to, um, uh, have you ever visited the uh, California Pizza Kitchen? <laughs> no, dear Lord, no. It's pretty delicious, Tom. No, no, it isn't, Greg. I mean, you might think it tastes delicious, but... They make a Cajun it. chicken linguine just how I like but it. But that's not how you're supposed to like it. Okay. You probably have quite uh, an undereducated palate, so let's go out and I'll teach you and I'll show you how to be rich. Okay? It'll be fun. Oh, before we know it, the two are sitting with napkins over their heads at one of the most exclusive pop-up restaurants in the city, supping on illegal songbirds. The scene that's such high comedy. Your gestures, Matthew, your intonation, the way you ceremoniously place the napkin over your head while Greg is all WTF. You've said scenes like this were nerve-wracking at the outset for you both, you and Nick Braum. Because in your words, you asked yourselves, what if we're enjoying it a bit too much and we're not being as funny as we think we are? Yeah, that's always a worry, I think. It's very clear sometimes when you see an actor enjoying themselves too much. They're always sort of indulging in it. It's difficult to explain, but I can see it. And it's not just a comedic thing. You can be enjoying the tragedy and drama of it as well. They're so beautifully written and so funny and so delicious. You learn the lines and you play the honest-to-goodness truth of it as much as you can. And that's how to... That's sort of how not to enjoy it. Rather than try and be funny, you try and actually play it straight and let the script do the heavy comic lifting. Precisely. When you've got writing that's wonderful, like we have with this, then it really does look after you. As opposed to writing, which is a bit patchy, and then you have to sort of bring something to it. It's a silly component, but it's like Shakespeare. If you commit to it and jump in, it's fantastic, but you have to commit to it. You have to let it look after you. And really good writing like this does the same thing if you try and impose your own ideas on it you sort of become unstuck or at least i do 
the simpler the better. Shakespeare wishes he would have written lines like, you lump of fucking turducken. <laughs> Did you squeal? Did you bitch me Pig out, man. pig man? Pig man. Pig that man. was really hard. Pig that was man. the hardest. That was the hardest. I was thinking of all kinds of terrible things. Try not to laugh. I would like that on my tombstone. <laughs> Did you bitch me out, pig man? Pig man! When Greg turns the tables towards the end of season two, let's Tom know that he did keep some of the crew's documents. It is such an oddly beautiful mix of emotions in that scene. Tom is being screwed. Screwed! But the giddy way he proclaims, Very well. I accept your blackmail. No, I'm not blackmailing. But you are, though, you piece of shit. I'm not. Greg, I'm going to accelerate you. Okay? New title. Ton more money, nice new office. You're moving up. You could throw away the training bra. Seat at the big table. That to me is Pete Wamsgams. Even in his yeah. darkest hour, he can't help but be proud of his protege. It's a wonderful pride in Greg. It's a bit of backbone, a bit of spine, and a bit of initiative, which he can't help but applaud. And it was, it's delightful, really, that. Especially after what's just happened. I mean, he's just had a total meltdown and sort of apologized for it. It's a sort of wonderful roller coaster of. <laughs> interaction between these two men. I think he really loves Greg. He genuinely feels like he's been divorced by Greg. I think it's really, really awful how Tom takes it. That's a good example of playing the truth of it because Tom throws water bottles at Greg's head is funny and in the wrong panic room. But actually, it's tragic because Shiv has just suggested an open marriage, which is wounding. And then Greg, best friend, protege, has wanted an open marriage, you know, wants to go and be a roving Waystar employee somewhere away from Tom. And I think it really hurts him. <laughs> I am a rock. I am an island. The arch yeah. comedy of these scenes, though, the hilarity of the water bottle flinging, the gold infused vodka, the ATN, we here for you, slogan brainstorm. Do you feel <laughs> like you're in the same show as dead eyed Jeremy Strong Kendall and his battle with stroke grappling Logan? Or are you and Greg, like, the show within the show, like Itchy and Scratchy in The Simpsons? I think we are in the same show, in the sense that Kendall is hilarious. I mean, the rap. L to the OG, dude be the OG, A and he playing. The vanity of Kendall Play is like preposterous. There's this 0.1% of wealth, these people, and they're ridiculous. But they're not, it's both. What happens to Tom and Greg, they're quite sympathetic in a funny way. They do feel things. They're not totally venal. Leads us to your relationship with Shiv, your honey badger, played by Sarah Snook. And the magic of acting, an Australian and a Brit on a beach, surrounded by cameras filming two Americans swamped by the inner demons of their relationships. In Tom's words... He's been shanghaied into an open borders free fuck trade deal. Does Tom really love Shiv? Or is it her family, the private jets and the power that he's fallen for? I think it's both. Like any relationship, you're attracted by the reflected glory of being with somebody. If you're married to someone with a good job, I don't think you would deny that he's trying to shin up the greasy pole of Waystar and being the son-in-law help. But I do think he really loves her. And wants to be happy. There's nothing he wants more in the world than to be alone with her, which is almost the last thing in the world she seems to want. People often say, why is Shiv with Tom? Why did she choose to be with this guy? And I think because he's never going to let her down. He's not going to break her heart. And perhaps she has had her heart broken and didn't like it at all. They rub along well enough and he's a safe pair of hands. I watched Tom and Shiv together. And I do wonder, Matthew, how you take the abuse, even as an actor. You said, though... You love the abuse. One of your favourite scenes you were asked for and you said the car scene right before the three-day feast of a wedding. Did you think again about whether we want to go Wamscans or Roy Wamscans? Or, as I said, I'd be willing to just drop traditional and go Tom Roy, in fact, for myself. You said, Shiv gives me this look as if I have three heads and it's delicious. What is it, Matthew? The side eye. The withering... Snook side eye. Are the scenes that you finish and you do feel low and impacted by them? Or are you just the kind of guy that walks off after being soul crushed in front of extras, the family that play your family, the cast, the producers, and you just walk off and like, great, where are we going for dinner tonight? That was fantastic. The latter. I mean, you feel the feelings, especially like the boar on the floor. Tom! Yes? Sit on the floor. It's fun. Seriously? Yeah, it's a game. Bore on the floor. I really, I feel... Get down! Bore on the floor. 
you sort of allow them to wash over you and then they're not real. So you walk away and you think how lucky I am to be working with these lovely people. Watching the degradation, the cuckolding, the betrayals, the secret keeping, the threatened threesomes. Oh, being offered up as a sacrificial womsgams just when we begin to wonder if there is no bottom for Tom. We find out there might be in the season finale, a rare moment of emotional vulnerability for succession. Tom searches for the perfect cove. So Tom, away from the rest of the Roys on their treacherous mega yacht and then delivers a scene that's sadder than Tracy Chapman's farce car. I wonder if the sad I'd be without you would be less than the sad I get from being with you. The human pathos of that scene, it's like he's articulating a sadness so infinite that it would make him even contemplate seeding his quasi-ruinous. Therein lies the brilliance of that scene. It's a big deal for him to say that to her. It's giving away a lot. And if you're able to laugh at characters, you're able to be terribly moved by them immediately after because you're paying attention to what's happening to them and people are inherently ridiculous and inherently sad and just a beautifully written scene that's the exciting thing about the show is that jesse and his writers they can do both nothing's just a comedy or just a tragedy there's elements of everything sarah snook told us you initially shot the scene without that last line but then added it in a second take so that shiv isn't let off the hook so easily i mean what does that last line mean to you he's actually articulated it it's a big deal he doesn't do that he's so tentative even when he comes back from the boar on the floor that terrible company away weekend to hungry maybe it wasn't totally great what you sent me to do which is kind of the opposite of what i wanted to do uh-huh yeah i mean we're a team right yeah but i i, I don't want to be a dick but maybe i should have a bit more input into team tactics he's being humiliated at her behest it's like forcing a terrible tidal wave through with the eye of a needle you can't say it he can't come back and give her a hard time he's too frightened he's too emotionally stunted so that's quite a big deal on the beach to say that i think the boar on the floor greg dumping him the senate hearings it's been a bad couple of weeks for tom yeah and the senate hearings was truly humiliating i mean just appalling disgrace he made of himself the atlantic <laughs> called him i think summed it all up that he became a smirking block of domestic feta and <laughs> and holly it's probably, probably probably the first time all season where tom's got a quasi win when you read the script for that mm. final episode were you proud of tom for finally 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 standing up for himself i was actually yeah I think it was a lovely way to go. It was a sort of development. Half of me can't wait to watch a single and ready to mingle Tom Wamsgams back on the open market with Greg as his wingman. But last question for you, Matthew. There is something that you've actually said about the condition of being an actor that I love. It was a quote of yours from a couple of years ago. You said, some actors get quite enough with the insecurities, longing for continuity and stability but I love the idea of not knowing what I'll be doing next. Or even if I'm going to work, the security comes as an actor in knowing that you're not in control. It's honestly advice that transcends acting. It's advice, life truth for our times, to be honest, in which we're living in so much uncertainty. But would you also say it's the best possible advice you could take from your own life for Wamsgams? The altruism of being in the moment and trying not to worry about things that are outside of your control. And then you see a flash of that with Tom because he's hedging his bets with everything. Brian called Tom's attitude to life panicky ambivalence. He can't quite commit to anything. And I do believe in the security coming from knowing it's out of your hands. And that doesn't mean being an amoeba and being inert. It just means being kind and trying to live in the moment and doing your best. And surrender to the chaos. Surrender to the chaos. We all are in chaos at the moment, aren't we? You know. There'll always be a Harrods PA opportunity, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Please put your fucking masks on right away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Matthew. Don't touch the donuts in the food hall, <laughs> you COVID bastards. <laughs> oh, Matthew, to you, to your success. Courage. I've loved it. Thank you so much. What a gent. We here for you. That's it for today, and that's it for this season of HBO Succession Podcast. This is Roger Bennett leaving you with some classic Tom Wamsgans. 
Well, if you look at item 34, it suggests boxes 2918 to boxes 3125 are now empty. Uh, they were full back in August, but when they were subpoenaed, they were apparently unavailable. And in the interim, they were signed out, and if you look at the ledger packet 15B, by a Gregory Hirsch. Is that someone known to you, Mr. Wamsgans? Uh, no, no, sorry. No? No? No, Tom? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, yes. No, known, known to me. Yes, in that sense, yes. In what sense? Uh, in the sense that, uh, that uh, what I understood that you meant. What that did they, you think I meant? That um, I knew of him, but no, no, I know, I know him and his face. Mm -hmm. Do you know what is special about the hours between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. on the night of March 12th? Uh, no, sir. That was the only two-hour period in which you did not send an email to Mr. Hirsch with the title, You Can't Make a Tomlet Without Breaking Some Greggs. You sent the same email to him 67 times in one evening. I guess it was a joke. <laughs> right. I wonder, uh, do the phrases human furniture or footstooling mean anything to you? Not that I'm conscious of them. Have you ever used another human being as a footstool, Mr. Wamsgans? Uh, I, Senator, I use a variety of um, target-oriented um, incentives to enhance optimal performance.